currently we're 2-0 and against TSM. Um, or not against TSM. <laughs> against 100 Thieves. Um, you guys beat yourselves on Breeze. Is that what you're trying yeah, to say? I know. Yeah, basically, <laughs> we did. We did. And we do quite often. Let's bring Juvenile on now. I think he's ready. We've got all his uh, mic issues sorted out. Preston, thanks for joining us again, man. Obviously, look, not the week one you guys were hoping for, but we've got to see some really interesting stuff from your team. And, you know, hopefully there's plenty of bounce back for you. Yeah, yeah. Even though we lost two, I feel like we played pretty well overall. Um, we did a lot of good things. We improved on a lot of things, I think, from the qualifier as far as um, some of our sloppy play. Uh, we didn't give away as many Ecos. The hard part was we lost post pistols on Ascent. Uh, and then on Breeze, I think we were pretty lucky to even be in the position we were in with a lot of good clutches. So um, <laughs> overall, like even though like I'm, I'm, one, I'm not one to normally take a um, moral victory, uh, it 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 wasn't the worst uh, kind of loss that we could possibly have for sure. Yeah, mm. I I wanted to chime in into this one too because I I had a chance to to catch up to a little bit of vods. I didn't get to catch all you of you but vods a bit, not as much as I I usually do, you know. So right now I didn't fully do my job. So uh, that's that's where I I take an L there. But at least mm -hmm. I was able to watch this this energy in TSM because I thought it was very interesting when I was looking at the scoreboards. That nice, we got some fades coming in. And, uh, you know, when we had these original discussions and were even me, I tweeted out, ah, I might see some fade on Breeze. And then I think you and I, Preston, we had a conversation to be like, oh, uh, you know, there's a possibility she might not be used on, on big maps like Breeze, but you guys use her. And I, I like that. The only thing that I that I noticed, though, was that you guys went into a composition that didn't have many flashes or at all. So what was the, the theory of uh, of the comp that you guys used going into this with a fade and a silver uh in terms of trying to get the map control with no yeah, flashes. it was like fade silver with viper like the standard stuff i feel exactly. like jet viper but mm -hmm. yeah fade silver is interesting mm -hmm. yeah on defense in particular it feels like fade is stronger than sky overall especially when you pair her with viper often mm -hmm. um because she her her util going through walls even though it's not a flash if you do the same as sky flash as you would a fade prowler through a wall Mm -hmm. I would take Fade Prowler through the Viper wall majority of time over a Skyflash. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty impressive going through Viper Util with Fade, mm -hmm. and so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to try to pair her together mm -hmm. um, on this map in particular. And then we also wanted to try to keep our Breeze, because we didn't think they were going to pick it. It was a surprise pick by them, honestly. I, I didn't think they were going right. to pick Breeze. Yeah. It was part of the thing. So we wanted to keep the comp somewhat similar and maybe run it similar to our previous Breeze as far as having the double drones. Mm -hmm. um, which is what we did before with Sky. And and I don't think we lost because of Fade versus Sky or anything like that. Like on mm -hmm. that particular game, it went OT and, and of course. obviously down to the wire. So um, I, I definitely think that uh, Fade brings some benefits and some strength on defense, but you give up some of the obviously team healing and then overall attack prowess that Sky brings, I think, um, compared to Fade. Yeah, no, I, I could see that because definitely looking at the energy lineup though, they, they also went for like a, a non-dualist comp. So was that like a surprise for you guys too. From the way that I saw it, I still find that Som was still able to get some good spacing from even using some good like, crowded steps. But yeah, it was like Sky Omen, Sova, Viper. It went double controller. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, they. Um. I, th I think we had actually surprisingly scrimmed them on Breeze like in the qualifier and mm -hmm. they had run that similar comp or maybe right after the qualifier before we learned about the matchups or the mm -hmm. groups. I mm -hmm. mean, so we had played them on that map and they ran double controller. So we sort of assumed that's what it was going to be. Um, and I feel like we, we adjusted pretty well this time compared to last time. Um, and I think even in scrim in the practice, I think it actually might've went 12, 12 OT in the, in the practice scrim. So um, okay. I feel that's... like we made good adjustments. We sort of knew how they were going to play. Um, and we just, you know, like I said, we, we, uh, we were in a good position to win. We just, failed at certain moments to use utility correctly honestly if i had to make okay. any any big reason for why we lost it would be mm -hmm. the individual mistakes with utility and and not using utility to gather information where we needed it yeah yeah sure. yeah because yeah. you obviously have a plethora of like ability like the resources to gain info but sometimes like to maybe even to execute off that right like mm -hmm. you know, we talked about like not being a ton of flashes there um but you still have that fade util to sort of rely on sorry Ben, go on no, sorry, I, I, and I, I wanted to chime into that too because I felt like there were some parts where uh, TSM as a group were still pretty good at getting like the, the A site, right? So the way that I saw it of, of, of the execution, especially with the fade, using the prowler, just like the, the like mini seekers, as you mentioned here, Preston, was really trying to clear out like palm tree off the initial viper wall that you get on the A side, while you could still have a split that goes into A holes for the other three players to control the back of the site. 
and go from there from other prowlers uh, and uh, Silva darts that could go through the wall. So I think in theory the execution uh, was quite good. But then going into like the the pulse plant situation when you guys still had a couple of uh, of of utility left, most of it was actually pretty much used to cover like under bridge back of bridge into the spawn side, but not really anything to oppress like the sliding door onto the A site. So what was there a reasoning why you wanted to leave that open into uh, allowing uh, energy to just fight out from that doorway side instead of using utility to prevent any pushes from there? Yeah, for, like for the retake, um, I think we just didn't really have any, any like dog is obviously a little bit better. Normally you use dog. Sky Flash, I yeah. would say better, is better for the double doors mm -hmm. um, than any of the fade utility because most of the fade utility, it feels like to get the biggest advantage out of it, especially Prowlers, you need to be close, right? So like mm -hmm. the closer you are to, to the enemy team, the stronger fade gets. And I feel like that's a long sight line. Mm -hmm. um, even from the sight to double doors feels long, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, especially with Prowler and stuff like that. Up versus like a Sky Flash and being able to peek off a Sky Flash is probably much better there. Um, mm -hmm. So I just don't think we had necessarily the tools to fight towards double doors the way we wanted. Um, yeah. And like I said, uh, honestly, we, we still should have won the match. I can remember right after the the timeout against um, Energy on Breeze, mm -hmm. they had Viper ults. And I remember like towards the end of the timeout, I was like, guys, just make sure we play the mains. Make sure we don't let them get Viper ult down. And then right after the timeout, they go straight into a B hit, get the Viper ult down, and we pretty much have to like force retake or yeah. force the save pretty much instantly. Yeah. Um, and so stuff like that, like uh, comps matter in the, in this game, 100%. Um, and there are definitely some things that you can do to affect the match as far mm -hmm. as comps goes. But uh, I think in this scenario, for sure, we were we were in a in position to win if we oh, just yeah. fix those little small mistakes. I agree. Um, it, it, overall. There was a lot of there was a lot of duels that came out in the end as well that just like it could have been to anybody right because that's what I've noticed mm -hmm. in that in that first map as well it's not like it's not like the nerdy shit that I usually coom over you know of like oh this is a great like shock dart to to sneak bite kind of thing it was just like body peaks get position and then yeah, it seems like really duel. fundamental right exactly yeah the fundies, like you play, you play off say. the you play off a bunch of info but like ultimately it ends up being really fundamental um, yeah. We talk about ascent. This is your map pick here, and you're, you're up against like this uh, this KO fade look uh, from from NRG. You guys obviously still working the Astra here uh, and still getting some value. Uh, obviously, your your attack definitely struggled to sort of string rounds together in that first half, uh, Preston. Yeah. Um. What's funny is that the comp that seems to be meta right now. Mm -hmm. um, which is the, sort of similar to what Energy ran. Even Europeans are running a lot of rays. Um. Breach or fade, those kind of things on ascent. Mm -hmm. So the the comp that we ran during the qualifier was like a week early, essentially in the meta, right? So I was, was gonna like, say, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We ran the meta, so I don't know if we created the meta. I don't know if we were just a week ahead because of the jet changes or what. But um, so there was a bunch of vod of essentially how we like to play ascent, mm -hmm. um, and every team decided to make that the meta comp now, I guess. And so everyone plays that similar way now, and we didn't really um get to scrim too much on ascent coming into this mm -hmm. uh just because we were pretty confident in sort of what we were going to do and and the way teams are going to play and i don't think we realized that the meta had fully adjusted to um everyone's playing the same comp now mm -hmm. so we hadn't yeah. played against that comp okay. yet basically yeah. so uh they, they basically had some body view of us um we didn't have any of them and then honestly the same thing it's 13 10 we lost both pistols mm -hmm. we win one pistol it's ot or we win you know what I mean? And all we had to do was win one pistol. So um, I feel like we played pretty well. We had four gun rounds on attack. So even though we didn't um, get a bunch of round rounds, we had four gun rounds on attack, half mm -hmm. of uh, Ascent, which I feel like is pretty good. You win pistol, that's a 6-6 six, six, half. It's pretty good. Um, and I feel like the, the big thing was on defense is once we started getting an op going, uh, their comp was really struggling dealing with um, seven getting an op, obviously. And, and I feel like if we would have had another round or two to play with, like, uh, we definitely would have won a sent and took it to a third map, but they definitely played well. They they they're the ones who won both pistols, so yeah. Um, they definitely deserved the win regardless. Was it mm -hmm. was it surprising to you though uh, of how aggressive energy were? Uh, with like there was there was like a one round where you had like the paranoia from Hayes from B main, alt from Som with a showstopper into into that side as well, and you had the 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 uh, the eye coming out from EU and then they're just overwhelming you guys so you haven't practiced against that comp but did you expect that level of uh, of aggression coming out from this team 
No, yeah, for sure. Definitely not. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is just, that's how that comp plays, right? So like mm. we played that same comp, uh, the week before with breach and yeah. that's just the way it feels sometimes is there's just so much utility to deal with whatever the problem is. Right. So like <laughs> you have stun, you have, you know, a bajillion things to throw at them and it's, it's always mm. going to feel very overwhelming and oppressive. I think when you play against those kind of comps and they do the right set thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's, Wind the clock back a little bit uh, and, and maybe have a look at some of these matches because I, I assume that like this is pretty critical time to like get a good feel for what the other teams in your group are doing, especially because like you know in advance that you're playing them. So this group structure gives you the time to like, you know, watch the film and like be ready for specific matchups. I'd love to know what, what your take is on how this the guard and 100 Thieves matchup went, right? Because the guard obviously really uh, peaked in a huge way and then Iceland things didn't go so well. And in this series, like this 100 Thieves team definitely seems like uh, they were able to catch them off guard, right? Like Fracture, I think it was like a 10 and two half, right? To, to start with. This yep. team has um, very quickly been able to get themselves into a position to threaten some top. I mean, the guard is like, you know, has a target on their back, I think, from being top seed after Reykjavik. Oh, mm -hmm. Whoa, what is your feeling sort of about these two teams and how they match up here? Yeah, I think going into this match, um, myself and even the players on the team, I think we majority of us probably assumed 100 Thieves is going to win. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think anyone expected it to be 13-5, 13-6 both maps. Um, yep. I think that's definitely not a complete fair showing of the guard and who they are. Um, but I think everyone knew 100 Thieves is just going to keep looking better and better. And, and they definitely look uh, extremely scary. Uh, and the big thing for guard, I think, is they're just going to need time to adjust. A, um, they were at an all-time high confidence going into Iceland, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and losses, no matter who they're to uh, or what place you actually ended, uh, suck, and they're definitely going to bring down your confidence. And so they're obviously not running at the same, the same confident level. And then overall, the team, when they built this team, it was like the best players at each role for their Tier 2 roles for the Astro meta, mm -hmm. right? So like... Jonah P was probably one of the best guys in tier two. Valen yeah. was probably the first or second best smokes in tier two. Say a play was probably the best jet in tier two at that time. And so they built that team with that meta in mind and they just need some time to adjust. Give them, give them a couple of weeks. If by playoffs, they still look the same, then, then maybe you can count them out. But I think right now, um, they, they definitely deserve the chance to, uh, to, to learn a new style and learn new yeah. agents and roles and, and have a chance to definitely compete this season, I think. That's what I felt too. I mean, if if you're looking at the composition of the guard, you already had three players that went into three different roles, right? Jonah P yeah. going into a raise, Sire player going away from a jet and then into a chamber, uh, and then Net now taking the responsibilities of having to play Viper when Jonah P was the Viper on this map. So you have a lot of tape on a team that's undefeated so far in Stage 2 in 100 Thieves uh, of how they play, but now you have to adjust to... Uh, you're trying to anti-strat 100 Thieves while still learning new um, uh, agent comps and trying to get that to work. And I feel yeah. that kind of like bit them in the ass as well, uh, where they couldn't get like the, the, the ball rolling on into into their half, which is why they lost like a 10-2. Um, what do you think about the, the Sage on Fracture, right? Because uh, it's, it's not in every comp that we sort of see this, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think this is optimal? I like so it. I like it. I'll let you talk about it first, Preston, but uh, I'll chime in after. Yeah, no, I I think Sage, like, it's it's a lot of run in Europe a lot. A lot of European teams run Sage. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like she's definitely viable if you have the players to play her, and I, I think she's she's really good. And obviously, mm -hmm. you know, 100 Thieves ran into um, to success. So mm -hmm. I feel like she's very, very good. And, and the, the way this map currently plays, she her wall can cut off very, very exactly. large angles, and a lot of teams are playing retake on A. Which I still confuse every single day. I can't believe that they did that <laughs> bomb site switch. Um, but a lot of teams are doing a lot of retake on A, and I think a Sage Wall helps cut off a lot of retake angles and helps you slow down the retake as far as that. Because as you know, the same thing in these comps, there's a bajillion utility that you're able to throw. So there's yeah, pretty yeah. much nowhere to hide, nowhere to sit. So I think the Sage Wall gives you a lot of space to have different unique angles and, and spots that you can play. Yeah. Oh my, I, why the fuck did they switch the bomb sites? Why yeah, I do not that? know. It, seriously, get it, I get it confused every time I try to say it. It's not even... <laughs> The map is left to right. Oh, I'm fucking tilted. I just realized that. Holy I got used to it. Lord. I got used to it. A and B. Don't, don't, don't put it on my fucking head, man. I got to cast this weekend. A is on the right side. B is on the left side. But I, I, I actually do like the Sage in here as well. Uh, I think it's more a, a culmination of how they use the utility 400 these in their execs. Because when I look at their, their A site hits, uh, what they do is they have 
um, Derek as the breach, and then you have Will as a chamber work together into a holes. While you have the other three players uh, running with a lot less utility. That's another thing from the guard where they have to like readjust their strat was that they didn't have a lot of presence into dish, and that was um, that was like free reign, free space for hundred thieves to go for a three two split. When that happens, and you're having to play a retake uh, play style for the guard into the A site then you don't need that much utility from 100 Thieves to get into sites. What do they use? They use two smokes from, from their Brimstone. Then they have a double satchel charge from Asuna goes into Sands. The other two players on the A side are pushing towards A. And then finally Stellar comes in and then walls into the spawn side. And then when the guard has to play a retake, you have five players that are now pushing back outside of the site, already getting ground control towards Sands, and you got nothing against you to to be able to like come out of like a sage wall and you're forced to come out of ropes and you're just losing your fights. And I think that if if a team was a little bit more prepared into how Hundred Thieves were trying to exec their split into the A site by just as Preston was mentioning, maybe having some players playing within the site on the on the upper platform or at the lower side, I think that would have had a different storyline into how Hunter Thieves looked really good on, on the on the fracture map. I thought you didn't watch VOD fans. What's going on? I mean, the ones that I've watched, you, you I've watched. Them? I told you, like that—that's why. Uh, that's why you there's not them? enough hours in a day. If I watch one map, it probably takes me like two hours. <laughs> you start watching um, at one point two five. I—I I, I was watching at one point five, Preston. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to Anderson. He reckons he watches it in four to eight x. <laughs> what? Are you like some eidetic, eidetic learner, bro? There's no way. Four to eight x. There's no way. To do that. Guys, it's like man. fucking Doctor Strange seeing the universe. Just eyes yeah. fluttering everywhere, and the smoke and the nade and the thing. Be, uh, it's <laughs> impressive if you can if you can really read it that quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, all right, let's get, let's get this next map of the series. I think that like the guard are in a bit of an identity uh, situation. Yeah. Right now, can we? Can we move on and talk about this this Sentinels versus Luminosity matchup? Because I think that was kind of, if we had a match of the week, this one might might have been it, right? Um, and I kind of want to, first I want to start with like where we feel like Luminosity are at. Because they always tend to like play spoiler in the first round of double elimination. Mm -hmm. I think they fucked up V1 like in two separate qualifiers just like in those first <laughs> matches. Like this team is, there's, the second you let this team start to, you know, run it on you, you you're going to get fucked up. Mm -hmm. Sentinels, they, I mean, they start buying off here. I mean, if you haven't seen it, I'd, I recommend checking this map out. Sentinels get a really good start here. They win a bonus. Um, uh, but Luminosity end up sort of resting control of this map back in their favor. And B-Dog almost drops 30 on the chamber. Well, that's that's just a normal B-Dog on bind too, right? That That's what <laughs> you have to be afraid of when you actually pick bind against LG is how B-Dog could actually like just pop off in so many moments. And he seems to be so comfortable on chamber attack side. And it almost it almost feels like Saya player uh, from the guard too, even though they lost their 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 map on on blind two, that he's able to get some great entries on uh, on B side with the with the operator. Um, so I, I feel that I, I even Sentinels as blind is their best map in my eyes so far in, uh, in on this stage. It's still a very hard map for them to win against LG, who are also very good on this map when B Dog could pop off and. When you have that with the support from Mata, it's it's just GG right there. Um, I don't think the playstyle changed that much into how how Sentinels played on Bind, just because they're probably like we mentioned before in, in episode 100, they need to deepen their their map pool a little bit more. Uh, when you already have Bind in the bag, you might practice that less so that you could focus on other maps, which is why finally we see like another three map series now from uh, from Sentinels. Um, so they kind of like. Wait, what do you mean? The reason slip. we've got three maps used is because tens dropped fucking forty on Breeze. But that's the other thing too. There's just that consistency of tens that he always gets. So if tens continuing to be able, able to fright the way that he does, good. I I, I don't like Rockus only just came back as the coach role into the team, and yeah. now with Ken Pecky coming in, like I mean Preston, we we've talked about it before, but we could hash it out again. You've coached Ken Pecky. Like for me, I think he's one of probably the best flex players that we have in North America. So to try to work that synergy between Kempeki and Tens, on top of now deepening the map pool and the strat book from Rockus and Shazam, there's still a lot to work on from this team as well. So it look, they look good within the second qualifier, but I, was, I still have my doubts going into the main stage. For me, this isn't my match of the week. This is just going to be another one of like, oh, they're playing against LG. There's a good possibility that they lose because LG is that good. LG is actually very underrated in that in that aspect. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for me, LG is sort of the team, and and I think Vincili from the nail on the head is um, if B Dog drops twenty five to thirty, they could beat anybody on any map. Yep. Um, and he can do it somewhat consistently, right? So like you know, like they're gonna be a hard team to beat, especially when he's playing well. Uh, and I think he continues to be their X factor. And I think one of the things that may take them to another level, and that could possibly that I've seen them improve lately, is modest play. Um, he seems like he's been a lot more consistent, a lot more um, frag power for them overall, uh, especially in the close qualifier and, and uh, a little bit here. But obviously, anytime you have B-Dog dropping 25 to 30, I think they can win any map against anybody. And I think uh, their matchup specifically against Sentinels, um, anytime that you're picking the other team's best map, even if it's your best map, you're going to have a hard time in the map pool. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's just an issue of, of limited practice time. Um, with this five, like even if they've they've had this five for a little while, um, you know, it takes time to build up a map pool. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, they're adding a new coach, a new meta. There's so many things happening that you can't expect them to have a super deep map pool. Um, but but that's, this is still what's confusing for me too is that Sentinels, if I'm not mistaken, unless the the VLR system is is wrong, but Sentinels ban banned Hyven. Haven. They banned Haven. Yeah. Right. And, I have no and, idea why. Yeah, that that confuses me a little bit. They banned Haven, I'll and then they fucking played. Fracture, which, yeah. if you recall, was was the map where they kept trying to force jet and lose. Yeah, like, or, or the then trying to bring in the raise and it still still can get good results, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a head scratcher for me as well. So let's start with let's start. Why do you think they banned Haven? Can we just can we just fucking guess? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm gonna let you guys guess because I'm gonna try to find the channel to see to see if there was actually a, an error or not in the bands uh, on VLR. Yeah. I mean, honestly, anyway, there's no way they play Fracture. There's no, I mean, you let surely you let Haven fall out of the map pool. You you would I would thought that I would have thought they would ban fracture, right? Mm -hmm. So if there wasn't an error, then they wouldn't have. I don't know. I just I don't get it. I, I can only it. imagine maybe if they were worried about jet changes, possibly changing the way they play the map too much. VLR's fun. um for like a short window. Yeah, and sorry, so not not not, not not to say that VLR shit, but it's just like the I think there is an issue between like the map vetoes and what's being uh, uh, fed so into true. VLR. So, so to look back here, if I'm looking at, at uh, on the 13th of May, so Sentinels banned Split, LG banned Haven. So LG did ban Haven against oh. Sentinels to make sure that that's done. And then after that, the other uh, bans came from Sentinels on Ascent and then LG Sentinels. on Icebox. And I think that makes sense too, okay. because because for me, when we were looking at Sentinels during the group stages, it was like uh, another big hit or miss where they were only good on one half. And then, uh, and then had some finally good results on uh, Icebox, when they lost like every single map at the beginning of the year until they finally qualified winning games on icebox so and i see now that it makes sense into uh what we have in terms of the cool. the maps that we that we're playing now and yeah. and I, I will say i think week one of this season was a little weird because we had the fade being, being introduced for this week um and you didn't really know the map pool of a lot of these teams and what map they liked and what maps they're good at and i think going forward week two and three you'll see a lot more consistency in uh, the ban and pick phase and where you'll see teams and have actual strength on certain maps here or there. Now, like a better idea of uh, what to expect. Yeah, look, yeah. I mean, we, regardless of who banned what, we got Fracture in the end, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it... Uh, are you sure it's not a bit reductive for us to sort of say that, like, Tens is not a good raise? Like, you know, is that is that really just letting the rest of Sentinels off too easy? Or is that, like, oversimplifying? Um, our take because obviously I think Fracture's a map that this team really needs to integrate uh, if they want to have international success. Look how much we saw it in, in Reykjavik, especially from the Southeast Asian team. Yeah, I mean you're still trying, you're still adding a little bit more into into the rest of, of Sentinels too, right? As when you're watching a lot of these um, a lot of these teams, you're putting you know a chamber that's very much needed and then you see now the integration of uh, Sage, which we just talked about from hundred these uh, from hundred these is Sage, that it, it actually works quite well, and I think the combination yeah. of a Sage and Raze is super important too. I think I think we're having also the the misconception of um, whenever we see tens on Raze, we expect that he has like the best satchel charges in the fucking server, and then that he's still able to create the space for the team. But I just find that the the comp in itself uh, is is where it's much needed to have tens on a, on a Raze, and you know throwing pain shells on a combination of a breach fault line and slow orbs is not that hard to do 
So I, I, mm-hmm. I don't think it's more on on Tenz's per, um, sorry Tenz's performances than it is on you know just Sentinels needing to rehash now everything now that they have the the coach and Ken Becky in here. I will say though that Rays, I think, and, and it's not on Tenz. This would be on Sentinels as a whole. Rays is an agent isn't as free flow as jet right like a jet you can yeah. really just walk around and take aim battles as you wish and mm-hmm. you'll have a get out of jail free card which is a little less now but it's still doable um with the jet changes versus raise like you 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 are a lot more if you take that aim battle you better win the first aim battle or you're probably dead mm-hmm. you're um, because destroy. you don't have the same escape tools and so raise benefits more from playing in a structured environment with set stuff with set things how to mm-hmm. take space so you're not forced to take random one-off one aim battles all the time and you can sort of um use your util in a team environment to uh get the most out of it for sure i i wonder what it looked like if you actually had tens on chamber instead if you put tens on chamber so that he could still get one shots as if he was playing uh jet nice for example uh maybe he you know he's been opping a lot less of course but i still find that the rendezvous with the headhunters could allow for him to to be able to get like those those one shot opportunities as capability while you have that flex player being kempeki he's still able to play a duelist uh, to, to try it out for Rays and see how, how that flipped over could work out. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say 100% just the last thing for that is Kempeki is a, amazing a duelist. Like, he was mm-hmm. one of the best duelists in Tier 2 up until I got him to switch to Sky. Um, and even when, when I was on the team, he would play Neon, and he's amazing. So, like, if... And you've seen multiple teams take their Jet player or their best Jet player and turn him into a chamber. Mm-hmm. I mean, pretty much every top team and top Jet has done that so far, so yep. I don't see why you wouldn't try to make that same adjustments for Tins if that's something that he's open to doing. I think it it definitely isn't to the best of his strengths, but I think the agent is broken enough that if you put Tins who can op and hit heads, like he's going to make impact on that agent regardless, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kempeki on Neon uh, is actually another good one too, right? That was mentioned yeah, in chat he's right really good. Yeah, he that's why play I wanted to see him play Haven. Or something like that, you know? Yeah. I know they don't yeah. want to play split, right? I'm pretty sure they they perma ban split this team. Mm-hmm. Or as that I don't know if that's wrong, but um the broadcast graphics showed that they banned Haven. Sentinels mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. So are you saying that was wrong? Let Bans. me scroll up and check once again here. Uh Sentinels did ban split, so that was correct. Yeah, no, it Sentinels banned split, but it also yeah. said Sentinels the, the broadcast graphics said that Sentinels ban Haven. Uh I see LG ban Haven here in Discord. Uh, when it comes down to like oh you are you're actually in the you're actually in the uh, vct discord gotcha correct, All right. correct, so, correct 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 so it's actually right so i just think this is interesting because it it, it there it influences an entire fucking narrative mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah i think the api was 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 wrong yeah and uh unless i'm still jet take... lagged and uh, and it didn't happen on may 13th but 05 13 2022 lg versus Sentinels. i'm assuming i'm the look at the right thing yeah no. <laughs> yep. So the map veto obviously happens in Discord, ladies and gentlemen. Then it gets plugged into uh, the broadcast. Then it represents on the graphics. So yeah, mm-hmm. should take that uh, pretty seriously. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Xet. Let's talk about Ghost. Uh, Xet, I mean, you know, a, a team that everyone is still excited about, I think, because, you know, I think, you know, Cryocell's joining this team. Uh, the, the chamber play, obviously, we knew that his jet play is very, very clean. Um, obviously, you know, people are excited about the chamber which we do see on both maps in this particular series ghost gaming as well uh really stepped it up i think uh even to qualify i think maybe not everyone would, i think you probably predicted in vans i think that's because yep. you love kaplan no personally no nope. um no <laughs> okay um, <laughs> he's a shit human obviously bringing bringing a, a pro to one of this team uh for example uh mm-hmm. seems to have been a great move obviously he was languishing for a while on on that L- lg team uh, and we get a we get a pretty decently close Haven map here, where both teams sort of getting pretty explosive on their on their offense sides. Mm-hmm. That's that's the thing for me with the reason why I predicted Ghosts going into into the main stage was, yeah, they didn't have the best results in their in their qualifier number one. But after watching what was it like the one of the tier two tournaments and then watching rewatching their games that they lost, there was still like that potential in there. And I feel that where they lose a lot of these rounds that that they need to fix a lot is overextension of of koala noob where he's standing out a little bit too far out uh and and staying a little bit too long when he should be escaping in 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 those cases so it's not necessarily putting all the blame onto koala noob but more as a team how do you enable koala noob to actually stay as long as he wants to so that he um so that he gets backup basically to support him to do that or how do you reel him back so that you actually play more positionally, uh, especially on defense? Because that's that's the reason why I think that uh, that their 
finding a lot of success too as a ghost team is when they're able to have Kualanu just pop off as well on on gaining that space on defense and and locking down and shutting down the initial uh, pushes and, and map control that you have from your opponents. Which uh, you know uh, I I actually didn't get to fully watch this game yet, so I, I can't really uh, get into that. But I think that's probably one of the things that they should be fixing at least for Ghost. And outside of that, the on paper they look fucking amazing. I think John Cutie has been doing a very good job uh, IGLing for this team. Uh, Nismo has always been a very consistent player for the longest time on Ghost, so I'm glad that he's gotten that break. And Brock is another one that I think is a great clutch player as as that initiator that maybe not many people have been paying attention to because it's also Ghost Gaming that finally gets the spotlight, right? And I think now they have a chance to really see what, what Ghost has in terms of capability uh, as a team. So, yeah, they lose to Exit, but... It's also a team from Exit that we expected that was going to be at least like fourth into their group, right? That they that they're going to be able to uh, to continue to be as good from like event to event and matches to matches. So it wasn't an easy match to start with. I feel like people underestimate. I think people were wanting to call Group B the Group of Death here, but I don't think we're actually seeing that at all. I think Group A is fucking nasty. I mean, <laughs> what's your take? You're you're in Group A, juvenile. What, what's your take on this? Because I think even like teams like Ghost who who dropped uh, obviously TSM still very scary as well. Like there's uh, the, the how the fuck are we saying the guard is looking is having the worst week one of any team in this group. That's frightening. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think um like both te both groups are obviously stacked. And like I said, I've said this multiple times again on the show is is that uh, especially at this rate, every team can beat everybody. All twelve teams can beat each other. It really just depends if you win both pistols stuff like that. But um, our group is definitely from top to bottom. I would say our, our group is probably probably better overall. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, especially because I, I really don't know how Cloud Nine is going to look with with uh, their changes. Obviously, so mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely think our group has a has a chance to be the better of the two groups uh, at the end of the day. <laughs> I. How we Sorry, just to chime in real quick too, because for me, the group of death, I think, is is very similar in both ends. Because I I feel that when you're looking at the levels of each of these teams, of where we kind of like rank them in there in North America, they're evenly matched in both of these groups, right? That that's why I think that there's not really a, a big group of death, but where within their own groups, there's just so much upset potential. How are Optic looking off the back of this Iceland trip? I mean. Uh, you know, is this is this team still like as clean? Do they come back home and still keep momentum? Like, yep. what do you sort of think? I mean, how much do we learn from this matchup against Phase? It's fucking sick. Also, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like that the neon here is fucking kind of kind of yeah. dope. Not gonna lie, Press. I don't know if you've watched this game, but I'll I'll let you start. Yeah, um, I didn't get to watch it, but I've scrimmed against Optic this week. Um, yeah. and in and in my opinion, uh, I feel like they've been absolutely amazing still, which is pretty crazy because normally you know after a big tournament you come home and you have whoever it is just running it down in scrims and one tapping you and one v4ing you after you just won a world championship you pretty much mm -hmm. don't want to be there anymore <laughs> um and so and so the fact that they come back and they look as clean as they did and they're still putting in the practice they're still trying out new comps they're running different stuff in practice um i think they're probably going to be they have to be the favorites for the rest of the season for sure i think yeah um and i think they'll have a better regular season than they did um this time yeah just the uh, just around in itself on or the map in itself uh, for optic and here on bringing out a neon and even a breach was actually quite uh, surprising for me as well. So if you're looking across the board, that's like what three players that changed in agents: Ye going to a chamber instead of a jet. I think Victor going to a neon, FNS going to a breach instead of a killjoy. But I find that FNS as that breach was really fucking cool because he's playing a B side and also a market rotate where. He could have so much support into the A side with how long that fault line is. I think there was like one or two fault lines that came from like mid side into tree and then a mid side into A main that actually allowed like uh, Optic to just Oof. capitalize on a good trade from even A side door. So they, they're they they're able to play a very passive uh, catwalk tree and still overpower you and not allow you to take the space that you think you have uh, for, for phase. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, Ye has been has been popping off on every single angle that he's had with the operator, and I think Marv has had some great anchoring on their on the defender side, and I I think they really came in with a game plan to to shut down Baby Bay uh, in pistol round just so that the economy doesn't get to roll as as well as they want to for for Phase because Phase is playing Counter Strike uh, for me in my opinion by having um by having a jet in the chamber. 
And, and the reason why I say that is because you're using jet knives and also headhunters to uh, into situations where you could hero buy two rifles when your opponents are on low economy. So you could hopefully keep the economy low against your opponents. And even if you die, you still have Bladestorm and headhunters to work with in the next round when the rest yeah. of your team's on a full buy to hopefully fully reset the economy of your opponents if you actually do win the round. Uh, but again, I feel that Optic Gaming has has put that on their checklist to make sure that Baby Bay is not able to be as activated as he usually is and uh, had a dominating uh, half here on uh, on their defense on ascent. Yeah, I thought I was well on. Sorry, dude. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think I think one of the things that we're underrating is like from the qualifier to now, like the jet change is huge. Like that's teams, so many players and teams yeah. relied on jet, and the old qualifier was on the easy jet with dash whenever you want, easy take jet. whatever aim battles you want. Do whatever you want, basically. Um, <laughs> yeah. And with the new jet, you have a little bit of rules you have to follow now, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a window, there's a there's a perfect perfect way to use it, not just use it reactively now. Um, and so I think that's a that's a big change the teams are gonna have to get used to. And I think going forward to week two, another thing that we haven't talked about is the week one matches were on Chamber having two alarm bots. No, so with Chamber having one alarm bot for week two, does that mean that we're gonna see more traditional sentinel? Uh, no mm. duelist chamber playing the duelist spot kind of thing, or are we going to see teams still rely on just chamber sentinel solo yeah. with just one alarm bot? Like, there's so many things that can happen yeah. between this next week, and yeah. so many of these players are going to have to adjust because they rely on jet and they rely on chamber and and stuff like that. So I, maybe cipher troops are becoming relevant again now, especially yeah. with less <laughs> that's jet what I was thinking. Them and now neon running, especially with neon. Them. Yep, yep. I, yep. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I don't have a fear for phase going into week number two, just because was it week number one or maybe during the qualifiers where they were playing bind and then you actually had Baby Bay on a chamber and then you had Dicey on a raise and then you had Poach like playing an Astro or something. I really can't remember, but they had a full change uh, in a comp where they still got rolled, but they are they are trying uh, to, to shy away slowly but surely from that jet. And, and to see how that's going to pan out actually uh, on on the uh, on the next chamber changes, but I find it actually quite interesting that you're bringing it up, Preston. That um, the jet changes have actually been more impactful than than I expected. I feel that on attacker side, jet probably could still run the same type of mechanics uh, as as you usually do, but maybe on on defense, you're you're feeling that um, that that change. Or, or correct me yeah. if I'm wrong here. Both, both, actually. So it's defense, um, sort of like like expected, right? Defense obviously is the obvious one. Attack, it seems like you would just be able to dash in, right? But especially when you play more of a free flow, loose style default, and you just you go for picks. Like the jet having the dash whenever he wanted was pretty massive because then you could force aim battles for a minute and a half whenever you wanted. At mm -hmm. any time, you could always force aim battles. And now you sort of have to think about when you're going to force an aim battle because the second yeah. you hit that shift button. You have 12 seconds to get value or you wasted it mm -hmm. um and so you can't just walk around the map at this point for a minute looking for aim battles the entire time yeah um, right. and sort of play that way and get create openings and so now you you do have to play more structured and to get value the most value out of jet is going back to jet dashing in and is that the best value that you can get out of an agent or would you mm. rather have something else um nade flash etc mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right Kind of check back in on Cloud9 here. Um, obviously, that, that's a team that's undergone some changes. We'll, we'll maybe cover that sort of after this match. But obviously, this is the last time that we get to see Zeta, you know, on this roster and uh, with Autumn sort of coaching it. But let's let's talk about the game here. Um, we got Icebox and Fracture map-wise. Uh, Cloud9 look like they're up to their old tricks, right? Leaf's still really punishing on the chamber. Uh, Evil Genius is running uh, Chamber and Jet here, uh, mm -hmm. a, as well as the Sage on this sort of map. So I like to talk about EG because they have really good attacking rounds here. I think they um, you know, they have a really they have a really solid first half. First half's like what is it like eight four for them? Yep, I, that's that's the thing for EG though. Uh, like I've I've mentioned it. I don't know on when, but Bustio and and Jogimo have I feel they have found their their groove into like the changes in their agent composition as a team for EG. Like Bustio is popping off as a chamber. Jogimo is actually showing that he is unaffected by the jet changes actually and is still able to to play quite well for the team. Uh I, I don't know. I, I and I think Bustio is even IGLing for the team. So even if Com comes in from a crew and is not playing the IGL role and playing even an initiator role, not IGLing and you're giving Bustio the role of IGLing and still fragging out as a chamber. 
this shows a lot of promise into how deep uh, they've been in the lab here between EG's IGL and also with fodder. Um, and they're looking really good. I think they're, we're finally going to be able to, 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 you know, turn our heads and focus a lot on EG and, and not sleep on them. Um, you know, I think they're, they really came into this main stage with the goal of not wanting to go 0 and 5 in groups. I mean, yep. they still went 0 and 1 today or yet or it was last weekend against C9, but to bring this game into like a, a triple overtime is already a great start when C9 has it's supposed to be that powerhouse coming out from uh, from the stage one, right? Even if they didn't qualify to Iceland. Yeah, I mean, I I think that you see nine. I, I don't know. When I when, when I'm on this show and we sort of start to segue into a match that involves EG, my question is always like, you know, how is this team developing? Are they mm. are they actually getting to the point where they can start to pressure top teams? So I think we're we're seeing that now, which means that like I think it's, we're gonna have to change the way that we sort of talk about this team uh, mm -hmm. because. They're in, they're in a very, like, like Preston said, this is the kind of competition now where uh, it is anyone's game because we have like the 12 best teams across both of these sort of groups here. Uh, the Icebox, obviously, like, yeah, like Van said, I think we went to 28 rounds on this particular map. EG still threatening to sort of uh, take the game away the entire time. And even Fracture, uh, to be fair, mm -hmm. uh, wasn't bad, for, wasn't bad from EG, right? I mean, yeah. this, this team is, uh, this team is rapidly developing into a threat here and, yeah, I kind of want to. I kind of want to focus a little bit on Boostio because Vance, he's the kind of player that you tend to highlight when we when we talk about EG. Yeah. Um, you know, I they, I think that you know he's I think what he plays he plays he doesn't play the the jet right. I think he he used to. That's Jordan the reason that why played the jet on this team when they had the fracture comp right. And when so, they had the chamber comp. Yeah. So so when when EG in the past were were going into like these uh, their old comps, how I want to put it is that you usually have reform playing a sentinel role like a killjoy or something yeah. then you have boostio playing the jet as the igl and then you uh, you had jogimo playing initiator as ko as well with their uh with foe being the igl um and then uh, xyz so ever since they brought in now now uh, uh apoth calm and changing the the roles around here i feel that it's been suiting him quite well i think reformed is able to play a little bit more of a flex role and still able to frag out where he doesn't have to stay behind around like cage of utility so that's another layer into it but i think now bustio as we wanted to we saw i i saw the talent that he had playing as a jet when he was like early days i was like that overwatch team that that he he that they moved over it was like second wind i think it was called mm -hmm. uh and then it was like okay i see potential now in bustio <laughs> in an op but then he wasn't putting up those numbers uh being like the the frag finder that they needed for eg and now that he's playing the chamber though he's able to play like you know the angled tpoa chamber type of play style which now again what happens in week number two now that Bustio is not able to? Well, I'm not gonna say not, but now that they only have one one trap, uh, one trip, w how is that gonna play a change the play style here for EG? If they well, still I mean, keep how, the how much there, does that change the play style for Chamber in general? Do you feel? I mean, like, is, how impactful is that? I correct me if I'm wrong here, Preston, but from from my from my experience of watching all these games, that the second alarm bot really doesn't do that much. For me, compared uh, depending on on what map you're kind of playing, but like for example, if you're looking at Fracture here and you're placing a, a, a trap towards that dish side, but your chamber is still playing on B like Boostio currently is, I think you're still covering enough ground because Boostio with uh, a trademark uh, headhunter looking down towards the B stairs is already going to be an alarm button itself that has his, that its capability as well. So I think I think to be able to do that. And then trying to see, again, if Preston's going to say, if we're going to bring another Sentinel in for that extra information, then the Chamber, the trademark just has too much value uh, right now. Okay. Or, sorry, the Rendezvous just has too much value right now for for uh, for, uh, for uh, Chamber to eliminate them. So what, what I actually have been told, sort of, um, because EU and LATAM or APAC, I believe mm -hmm. they were playing on single alarm bot Chamber for a oh, week shit, one, okay. I believe. Um, and so what I've sort of heard is sort of that what they're doing is sort of treating him as a duelist now, and then he gets to use the alarm bot for himself selfishly. Uh, and then and then you you play around it like that. Um, and so I think maybe we could see some more double sentinel comps, and like I said, with Chamber playing the um, the duelist role, mm -hmm. um, especially on maps like Breeze, like Icebox, the maps where you you traditionally the the duelists haven't brought insane value already. 
Um, and so I, I definitely think we'll see more and more of that. As far as uh, Bustio and like EG and, and like his play style and stuff, I, I think it's they remind me of almost like a lesser experienced LG in the fact that if Bustio drops 25 or 30, um, they can beat anybody, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think he's just a little bit less consistent than B Dog in that way. Um, I think he still does it pretty often. Like his his stats and stuff on Chamber have have been for a while, and they've been playing this this comp and these guys playing this way throughout um, the past month or so since comp has been there. I'm pretty sure. Um, and and he he pretty consistently drops bombs. He's just a I would say a little less consistent than B Dog, but they still have the same threat level as as like a LG. I think as mm-hmm. far as beating the the top teams on the right day. I mean, I kind of like the idea of you know, these teams using Chamber as a duelist because he's more flexible than Jet in terms of posting out on angles and getting out scot-free. And yep. obviously, he also has the ability to be low econ for a round and still have operator pressure. Uh, yeah, at this so point, he's, he's almost... a better Jet. Yeah. yeah. That's the, yeah. that's just mental to me. I, uh, I we, can't wait to watch these VODs <laughs> for Cloud9 because at the Icebox comp was probably one of the things that I was like, oh, uh, you know, you'll probably get a good value with like a, a fade and KO or like... Uh, I was even thinking like a single initiator fade uh, uh, as other things. And to see that Cloud9's been running it, I want to know how you're gaining map control on that B side. Uh, we actually but... scribed them some on, on that comp um, okay. on Icebox. So what's your and, take? Um, I, my take is that it's very difficult for them to go B once you get a knock. Mm. Yep. That's that's the biggest take. So because they don't have drone or anything, pushing people yeah. off of yellow and B is, it seemed that they were possible for them to do it to us. Even if you um, kill we a knife on, uh, on yellow, right? If you it, heard of a yeah, spot. even if you kill a knife, because the guy on top yellow can shoot it, honestly. Yeah. like They can't really peek because they're afraid of the op still, so they can't peek on the KO knife. Mm. Um, and so you're able to just shoot it from on top of the yellow and then just hold, mm-hmm. the, hold the angle, especially if you get a second person posted there with you um, to hold while you do that kind of stuff. But I think there's a way to round it, um, and that, that was early in the week. I'm sure mm-hmm. they've perfected a B take a little bit more. You could probably find some cool eyes. Um, a lot of the eyes you can really do is like land on random roofs in the middle of nowhere, and you can't really yeah. even <laughs> see them unless you're like looking straight up in the sky. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, I think there's probably some unique things you can do. I think it's just going to be very difficult to play that map in particular without Sova. Mm. I mean, they, they obviously won. They won, so. <laughs> yeah. Let's can we let's have a look at next week's games as well. See if there's any ones that you guys want to highlight as uh as must watches here. But phase LG, Ghost Guard, TSM I mean, hundred Thieves. TSM I mean that's thieves for fascinating. Their fucking clout. Yeah. <laughs> Optic C9 obviously is gonna be huge here, but yep. what 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 are the what are the sleepers here? What are the what are you guys the matchups you guys think could be the most fascinating, most interesting? EG Sentinels, I think, is gonna be a good one. Because as much as, as we're seeing e, like I said, EG is like on an upwards trajectory and Sentinels is like in a shaky position. This is like a very good test, the uh, uh, like a very good pulse for both of these teams where for Sentinels is, okay, well, they needed to fix on a couple of things. We still don't think that, at least for me, that they're into that top 10 in North America yet. Will they shut me up and then dominate EG? Or will EG now finally have that type of like structure that is able to to suppress and and overtake a team that's shaky like like Sentinels and then get that confidence to continue within the groups. I think that's that's my match of the week to watch outside of the clout. You guys, you guys can't tell me that this roster change for Cloud Nine is is good for them, right? There is like no world with this. Like, did they even have a fucking say in this? Obviously, for those that don't know, T One have announced that they're acquiring Autumn and, and, and Zeta, but they're not moving to Korea, which is something to bear in mind. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can, can someone please explain to me what the incentive is for players literally on a VCT team going over to a team that is not in the VCT for the remainder of this season? Like, what, what what the fuck is going on? Do they get, like, it's like it's just fat stacks. Are they just getting a ton of money? Oh, what? Yeah, I'm not really even sure. Like, uh, we actually, so I think Cloud9 has known about this at least for a little while. We played them during the week, like I said, in the scrims, and Zeta wasn't there. So mm-hmm. they've at least known for a few days prep before VCT that they knew Zeta wasn't going to be there after that match. Um, and I don't really know how it came along. Just as random as it is to you guys, it felt that <laughs> random to me. Um, obviously, Curry is a great player. They know him from CS. Um, and so, like, that sort of makes sense. But I don't Chaos. really know like how it happened, especially with this kind of timing. Mm-hmm. Um, in the in, uh, after the season has pretty much already started, I, I think obviously they're still going to do great. They're still going to do amazing, but they're definitely going to have to adjust some things yeah. uh, to incorporate Curry. And, and I feel like somewhere like Cloud Nine could be somewhere where Curry excels way more than what he's shown so far uh, under T1. Obviously, 
I I just feel that C9 and T1 it screams to me that they're you know in the talks of of the franchising for for 2023 and probably both C9 and T1 have good chances of being part of that franchise. And then it was mentioned from Autumn and from um and from Zeta that they were looking for better challenges within uh within Valorant and apparently North America too. And they always thought that T1 was like a very Pre, uh, prestigious brand and organization to play for, especially if if you're from Korea, just probably because of Faker, right? Uh, Faker in T1 and League of Legends is a great name. League of Legends for T1 is also that's a great That's exactly board. what the Comcast motherfuckers wanted when they bought the brand. Yeah. That's exactly what they wanted yeah. because Joe Marsh loves Korean esports. He fucking loves it. This guy <laughs> um, is just... He fucking loves it, man. Um, <laughs> but this team is not going to Korea. Mm. This team is not even going to be full Korean, from my understanding. I, I, at least, at least that's not that's not no. Yeah, no, apparent no. to us yeah. right now. Obviously, yeah. there's you know Sire uh, and and now Zeta on this team. But I, don't, you know, it's yeah. It definitely seems like a, a play for next year. But I also I think you know Jack posted on a Reddit thread. Mm -hmm. about this you can go and look for this yourself if you want and he implied that this was something that they wanted they wanted exactly that, that zeta yeah. and autumn wanted to make this move mm -hmm. which is bizarre considering t1 as a roster is just completely um uh, their their image is marred by mismanagement right i think like we, we always talk about on this show like some of the extremely questionable things that we heard from the valorant di division i mean we fucking we had people come on the show to talk about their personal experiences with the right also, you know, what happened in, 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 you know, in South Korea right now, they're doing great, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, this, this T1 roster. But, um, you know, I don't think they have a very good reputation in North America at all. Uh, and bear in mind, like, they just fucking brought, they brought steel on, on this team. So they're not trying to go full Korean. I don't, I guess they're trying to make the play for 2023, but it just yeah. seems odd. They also, they got rid of, they got rid of David Denning as well. Yeah. So making coaching. Rebuild. Yeah making coaching uh, changes now. I mean, and, and this is the thing I think that for a lot of people trying to wrap their head around because David was the head coach. Uh, he wasn't just a psychologist or anything like that. Legitimately a head coach, someone who was obviously, you know, as we interviewed him, someone who was definitely very interested in, in sort of the mental side of it and trying to bolster that with their team. But- um, was picking up cheaters, you know, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's that. Uh, but then, you know, I think T1 realized, hey, we want to, we want a coach coach uh one that is sort of you know i mean i guess any coach Coaching. can tell their team to go sewers right yeah but uh <laughs> autumn autumn joining this roster definitely feels like they're they're making a play for a very known quantity in a coaching role here you go nice job uh, to find this yeah and, and my bigger question is well, how is c9 gonna look in this right now right like are they are they gonna be, be able to continue uh a, a, a good run and and like the high ceiling that they've already set um, or the high bar that they've already set since LCQ for 2021 for me. I my my first initial reaction is I'd like to say yes. I think Curry does have the uh, the firepower for it, but I just want to know how the synergy is going to look. Of course, the synergy w with these five players is going to gel because, as Juvenile mentioned, they know each other from from Counter Strike, and I'm pretty sure Curry played with Chaos at some point as well. So you're getting mm -hmm. that you're getting that reunion right there. But where that synergy that I'm talking about is how are these roles going to mesh out? Because I think Curry's most recently before T1 got out of the uh, got out of these roster changes um, was that he was playing a lot of flex roles with like a KO and like Sky and like a flex role of a KO is is Zeppa right now and he's playing that super well. Uh, is Curry going to go into more firepower positions as a chamber or something when Mitch? Being flexible as he is, could go. Yeah, he's going to move back to silver or something. Or... Exactly. So there's a lot of or... shit that uh, that I need that I still want to try to figure out where Cloud Nine is going to be headed to. And already, it's it's going to be in a couple of days where we know uh, if there's going to be some major changes or uh, or not in their in their in their rules. Hmm. Yeah, I guess you know it kind of sucks. This is what happens, by the way, when like something bigger gets announced for the next year. People start making a play for the longer game and like. Mm -hmm. Their prospects look i'm not saying carry on c9 is, is not going to sink their ship right again he's back no. on the with his, with his old chaos teammates so that's that's fine but it's just it's pretty clear to see like that people's sights are set a little bit further than champions this year mm -hmm. um 
which is fair enough. I'm sure that for Preston, is that uh, his eyes are fucking locked on uh, on his next week matchup against 100 Thieves, which is going to mm-hmm. be kind of sick. Before we let you go, how are you feeling about that one? How are the boys feeling? Obviously, you're looking to bounce back after week one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we lost week one. Um, currently, we're 2-0 and against TSM. Um, or not against TSM. <laughs> against 100 Thieves. Um, you guys beat yourselves on Breeze. Is that what you're trying yeah, to say? Yeah, I know. Basically, <laughs> we did. We did. And we do quite often. Honestly, on on most maps, um, but I feel like uh, obviously they've improved a ton. Um, it's going to be completely different comps this time going in. Probably a completely different map pool going in, um, and it would definitely be interesting to see if we can make the adjustments needed to um, to try to get the win this week for sure. Uh, I feel I feel overall pretty confident. I think the players feel confident, um, and I think you you could obviously continually. I will always have some unique stuff coming into the matches. So, oh, yeah. um, definitely always always fun to watch. Ah. Looking forward to it, and uh, thanks a bunch for coming on the show. Thanks for helping us make sense of the the sort of primordial soup that is week one of VCT. Always a ton of questions that we have, I think, sort of whenever we kick off with this group stage, and I think next week as well on a bit of a new meta, we'll have plenty more of those. So good luck, TSM. Thank you very much, Preston, for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back after the break. We're going to talk uh, we're going to talk EMEA, VCT, because obviously that's happening. We're going to bring Coach Emil on. Mitch is going to start talking. Bit, so, yeah, don't go too far. We'll be back. Sorry, Mitch. Ha, ha, ha.